This is Not Monogamous Mark, and I'm going to tonight ask you a question that I'm going to answer myself in this video. And that question is, what is the journey that took and led you into living your sexually liberated, ethical and consensual, non-monogamous lifestyle? You see, for me, it started, I guess, when I got married, or maybe even before that, in that uh, when I was in middle school, you know, like about eighth and ninth grade, I was girl crazy. And one of the things back then that I found is that the girls kind of liked me too. And I was rather bold in that, uh, for instance, I'd go to a dance and I'd see all the girls lined up on one side of the gym and I'd see all the guys lined up on the other side of the gym. The guys were afraid to go over and approach the girls and the girls waiting to be approached. And uh, so I'd see what's going on and I'd walk across the gym floor and I would start approaching girls because I figured hey they're here just like I am they're wanting to you know enjoy spending some time with a guy and dancing and what have you and and so I'm gonna go over there and ask a gal that I am interested in and ask her to dance and if she doesn't dance they won't want to dance with me then I'll just go ask another gal there's plenty of, of fruit on the tree to pick and so I didn't have to be it was, it was a world of abundance and not a lit world of scarcity plenty of fruit to be picked and because uh, that's because all those guys they were too chicken to go across there and start picking the fruit and so from that uh, um, you know I, I was dating um, girls very young in my life I guess and a gal asked me one time to come to church with her well I had used to actually brag about never going to church my mom and dad uh, stepdad they didn't require me to go to church and so it's like that was a cool thing because some of my friends you know their parents hauled them off to church some of them, their parents would drop them off to church and then go back home and pick them up later and for me I uh, didn't have to have anything to do with church well but then once this girl asked me to go to church and I went to church with her and I started finding hey there's some other really good looking girls that are kind of cute and I kind of like them in this church and so I wanted to keep going back and uh, so from that then um, I ended up becoming a born-again Christian at a very young age I think I was probably about uh, 15 years old when that happened and uh, then I started going to church you know I'd go to Monday night prayer and praise group I'd go to Wednesday night Bible study I'd go to Thursday night choir, uh, choir practice I'd go to Saturday um, what was on si something on Saturday uh, uh, Saturday was youth group and then I'd go to Sunday morning church service and then Sunday Sunday school and then Sunday evening church service I mean I was deep into church life and so one of the things that I learned from that is that I wanted to be a virgin when I got married, and I was. And, uh, and I married a nice church girl that was raised, and her family took her to church and everything. And I married a nice church girl, and before we got married, you know, we didn't have full-on sex. We, you know, would take and stroke each other to an orgasm and things of that nature once in a while and play it all around and have a little hanky-panky knowing that, oh, you know, that's uh, something the church would frown upon. Um, but we didn't have penis and vagina sex until we were going to be on our married night. We talked about that we wanted to enjoy an exciting and fulfilling sex life in our marriage. And we had gone to, before getting married, you, uh, in our church environment, we went through a 12-week uh, premarital counseling workshop. And uh, in that workshop, you know, two of the weeks was dedicated to your sex life. And, uh, and so it was something that we had talked about. And sure enough, then uh, there we was the day. Got married. And uh, went off that then from the, getting married in the church in the afternoon and going off to the hotel where we were staying in that night and, and get naked together. And, and uh, my wife says, I want you to always be able to take and wake me up or have as much sex as you ever want to have. And uh, so we had a wonderful first night. And we went on a two-week honeymoon. Came back from the end of that two-week honeymoon and uh, pretty well the honeymoon was over. And that I think by then and my wife had figured that yeah, she really just wasn't interested in sex. And, uh, and yet I had a high sex drive. And so when I got back also, I went from being part of the youth group that we were always part of, and I became part of the men's group. My wife, she went from part of being part of the youth group. I was 22 years old at this point. And my wife went from part, being part of the youth group to being part of the women's group. 
Well, and, and now looking back, I, hindsight says that's really for, I don't know what goes on in women's group, but with, with men's group, that's where all the religious doctrination takes place. You know, for instance, one of the first things that I learned is that there are things that we don't, this is uh, in the early 80s, uh, late, well, 1980. And uh, it's like one of the things we don't do is we don't talk to our wives about our temptations of wanting to look at pornography and dirty magazines and X-rated videos or anything like that. You know, I mean, the Internet wasn't even born yet. And, uh, and so it was mostly just what you'd find in videos and magazines and what have you, you know. And, oh, we'd get so tempted to want to take a look there. And then our eyes, we'd see another woman and our eyes would have lustful thoughts for that other woman. Well, these are the things then we were taught in men's group not to talk to our wives about. Instead, bring them to men's groups so they can help us with our problem, you know, and pray over us and talk with us. And, and, but, boy, we really were not to take and talk to those things, talk to our wives about those things. And so I learned uh, there right early in my marriage that, yes, you know, the things that are deepest, most intimate in my life were not things then that I was to share and talk with my wife about. And instead, talk to the men's group. And so that was just kind of the start of it. And so there we were, you know, back from our honeymoon. I've been in men's group then for a couple months. My wife's in women's in women's group, and uh, and and sex is not going good. And it's like I want to turn my wife on, and get her excited about my my touch, and get her excited about you know having an orgasm or something, but it just didn't happen. And, uh, and so I figured that I just didn't know what I was doing. And, and um, you know, so I, I figured I needed to, to learn things. And so how do you learn things? You know, in, the, in our church environment, you, you know, you, you don't watch dirty movies and learn from that. You don't talk to anybody else and learn from that. I mean, there's no way to really learn anything. And so in our environments as well, when you have problems in your marriage, then you go and get counseling. Start with getting counseling by the pastor. And then maybe, you know, he'll refer you off to a Christian counselor and get counseling there. And so that's the process then that my wife and I went through. We, you know, we got counseling by our pastor about our sex life. It just wasn't working for us. I mean, I was, I was by uh, six months into our marriage, I was frustrated because I just couldn't turn my wife on. And so I was just really frustrated. And I wanted to enjoy being able to have sex for hours, not for 10 minutes. And so, you know, I'm trying to want him to figure these things out and just thinking, well, I just don't know what I'm doing. And so we went to the pastor. The pastor then suggests we go to a Christian marriage counselor. And so we went to a Christian marriage counselor. And, you know, that just started a long process for us. It was a 20-year process. We went to doctors, went to counselors, went to a sex therapist for a year and a half, and that that alone cost me enough. I could have bought a brand new automobile for what I spent with that sex therapist, and, uh, and just we went through a long. We went to workshops, we went to seminars, and oh my gosh, we even did this, a couple things that our church would have frowned on. You know, we we went ahead and we got some adult how-to videos, like how to uh, have an erotic massage. And, how to perform oral sex and how to do this and how to that. We went to an adult store and we rented some adult videos that were how-to videos. Well, that didn't do it. And so then we thought, well, maybe you know, we can, we can uh, maybe light some fire and, uh, and we'll, we'll go out and we'll rent a couple, a couple X-rated videos and we'll watch those. Well, I found out that, yeah, my wife got a little turned on from those, but oh, they just, that was just too dirty to, to, to watch those. And she, she just felt bad about it. And, uh, and so she decided that that's not something we should do. And I said, well, we got this new satellite thing now. This years ago, remember, and satellite technology was just brand new. And we got this new satellite thing coming in now, and, and I can subscribe to this Playboy channel. How about if I just subscribe to the Playboy channel? And because we didn't have kids at home or anything, we didn't, we never had kids. And so, you know, it would be like it just would be there on our TV when we wanted to just like have that little extra fire or something. And so I subscribed to that, but again, and there's nothing that she would, she would ever want to watch. And um, so we, we would go and we'd, we'd buy books. And we'd read books and about sex, 
and uh, I, I kept trying to work on my technique and and I just again I just thought there was something I wasn't getting quite getting it and so we kept working on it and about every two years three years I get so frustrated wanting to have a, a, just a more fulfilling beautiful sexual experience um, that I would blow up and we'd have an argument those are the only things that my wife and I ever argued about and it was about sex we didn't argue about money and fight about money and didn't you know all other things that you find you hear couples that argue about these things and no for us it, the only thing we ever really argued about was sex every two to three years and as a result of that then we would end up you know I'd blow up and we'd sit down and work through our problem then we would come up with a new plan what's our new plan gonna be you know read some new books or you know what I mean we came up with a new plan every three years on the average for we did that for 20 years and then new plan, you know, involved in going to counseling, going to workshops, going to therapists, reading books, watching movies, you know, all kinds of things. You know, in 20 years, you know, every three years of having a new plan, that's about seven different plans we'd come up with. And after 20 years, well, we simply had run out of plans. And uh, and after we ran out of plans, then I, it's an interesting things going on in my own life. I became the religious person I never wanted to be. You know, I mean, I was out there saving souls and, and knocking on doors to, for the church who would have a program we call an evangelism campaign. And I'd be knocking on doors and helping other people, teaching some other people in our church how to do this too. I mean, I was a leader in this program, you know, the evangelism program. I mean, I was on the Billy Graham Crusades program when the Billy Graham would have a big function, a big event in Seattle, Washington. Then I was part of this, this, the the evangelism staff there with the Billy Graham Crusades and so you know I had really become a very religious person and over time that religious person it changed me I wasn't the the, 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 the happy kind caring loving youth that I was as a teenager I lost all that and I, I became I was a, a business owner and had a employees and responsibilities and customers and, and had you know all the, the success of being a successful business person in my community and I got into where I really I just really didn't like people and um, I was better at talking about being a loving person than I was about being a loving person I was very judgmental I was self-righteous I was pious and so you know that was something that one day I woke up and I saw myself and I realized that I had become the person that I never wanted to be. That was a very religious person because when I was a youth, there was a family up the street that, that even though I was involved in the church, nobody else in the neighborhood had wanted anything to do with that family because they were so holy and they were so religious, nobody wanted anything to do with them. And here then, in my 40s, I woke up finding that that was me too. And so when I saw that, I just realized that it was the church and this indoctrination and this process that for the last 20 years, 25 years of my life that I had been through and I decided I'm not, I don't want anything more to do with that. And I walked away from that, which was a pretty big deal because I mean, I was serving on, on, on Christian boards. You know, I was the chairman of the board of a nonprofit organization that was a Christian ministry in the Seattle area. And, and uh, when I went out and talked to, to dozens and dozens of churches, and, and so there was a lot of, lot of uh, involvement in my life that suddenly when I decided that religion was not something I wanted anything more of, that was a big change in my life. It was an about face. And yet that left me also with this void of like, now what do I do? I mean, I've been living my life to please God and think I was pleasing God, but I now realized that I couldn't possibly be pleasing God in my life. And so I went on a journey, realizing that I really was not a loving human being at all. And I realized I wanted to go on a journey to kind of get centered into my, my being again, my inner being, and, and learn where, where is that loving human being. And interestingly enough, at that point, right at the point when I stopped going to church, my wife, she continued going. You know, she we, we're, she'd going to church all the time and continued in a women's group. And 
And she never once even asked me, Mark, how come you don't go to church with me anymore? You see, because that whole process of indoctrination in the church where I learned not to talk to my wife about anything that's really important, guess what? Then when I stopped going to church, you think we would talk about that? I mean, we'd been going to church for 25 years. But no, we wouldn't talk about that. And she wouldn't even ask me a question about that. That's kind of where our communication was in that monogamous relationship at that point. And so I walked away from religion and I started to go on a soul search and a journey within myself. Nothing that I talked to my wife about or anybody else about. But I pretty well left had left my, my friends and the people that I associated with, you know, because I walked away from all of that and and I just kind of went for my own on my own little journey. And along the way I started to, you know, just find that yeah, I, I didn't have to be a religious person. I could be a loving person. I could be a because seeing the where my my religious past, well, I was taught through all that indoctrination is that yeah, if you weren't you know if you weren't involved with Jesus and if you weren't involved in church, then there's no way you can be a loving person because you didn't have the love of God inside of you. That's what I was indoctrinated to believe, and so. I realized that I needed to find that loving person that is me. And uh, over, over a period of about two years, I did that. And one of the things is that I was always a little curious about was going to a nude beach and just having an experience of being naked with other people and just enjoying being naked. And you see, out of my business took me to Portland, Oregon uh, about twice a, a month, every two weeks, in fact. And, uh, and so there was a February day where it was a week, in fact, where temperatures were in the low upper upper 70s and low 80s. It was just incredible. It was unbelievable for the month of February. But it was just a really crazy existence, a crazy thing that happened. But And so I happened to be in Oregon that week. Now, Oregon's right on the Columbia River, and there is a, a, a beach there on the Columbia River. It's called Collins Beach. It's a Portland City beach and it is a nude beach. I had heard about that and I kind of then one day I says, you know, I'm done with my business here in Portland. In fact, I was done early. I'm going to go check out that nude beach. And so I went off to Collins Beach and as soon as I got to um, be, I get past these signs that says, you know, nude people beyond here, this sign, be careful, be wary, you know, you're out, you've been no, notified. Well, as soon as I got past that sign then, you know, then I went ahead and I stripped my clothes off and I just went for a walk. I walked all the way down the beach. I don't know how long it is, maybe, a, maybe a two miles or so. I walked all the way down from, from one end to the other end and then back. And, you know, there were even people that were having sex on the beach. Now, that's not, it does not happen today because they really clamped down on that on the beach. I guess some, some people have complained. Uh, that's really too bad because it was... Really, I, I remember stopping and watching people have sex on the beach, and it was such a beautiful thing to watch. And, I, I mean, wow, sex on the beach. And they were really enjoying themselves. And so, you know, after that, I returned home, and I kind of kept that whole experience a secret because I couldn't shh, tell my wife about that or anything. Well, there was a couple I had met on that beach, though, and we were emailing back and forth about their experience and how they came to become nudist and they had started going to a swingers club in fact and in Portland. Uh, they hadn't yet you know kind of done a swap situation but uh, where they've had a good time watching other people have sex and they've had a good time having sex letting other people watch them have sex and uh, and so that was fun for them you know and and so they were just kind of getting their feet wet at that point and so I was kind of interested about, about the process. So we would email back and forth. And, uh, and, and one day my wife saw one of those emails. And oh boy, she get upset like, what is this? What is going on here? And so at that point though, I had already been processing where, you know, I really think that, in fact, this is that we've been married at that point 25 years. And after our 20th year of marriage, We've kind of gave up on the whole process of, of uh, even working on our sex problem anymore. And so we didn't come up with a new plan like we had always done before every two to three years. And so after 20 years of marriage, we just kind of gave up on it. 
And I had been kind of then thinking, you know, that I am, I'm not willing to go the rest of my life in this marriage with a woman that I love, but be miserable sexually. And so, and so I was somehow going to have the gumption to actually talk to my wife about this, and and maybe then I, I, we can, I can go off and have sex with someone else, and she can have sex with someone else, and we can have an open marriage. And so I've been thinking about this and kind of working up to it, and I realized that 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 possibly could mean that she'd divorce me. And uh, I was willing to take that risk. I would rather be divorced and go on to ex at least experience a happy, fulfilling sex life where the woman really wanted me sexually than to never experience that. Now, it wasn't like we never had sex. You see, my wife, she thought it was her wifely duty to have sex with me three times a week. And so three nights a week, we'd end up going to bed and she'd say, okay, do me. And she'd lay in bed, and if it took me more than 10 minutes to come and have my orgasms, then it would be like she'd say, well, can you hurry up? <laughs> and so, you know, it was like, that was, that was, I just found that miserable. Yes, I needed the release. And, and so I, I was enjoyed at least having a nice warm body to release into, but, oh man, it was just miserable even though I was having sex three times a week, which, I mean, that was far more, more than what the average married couple had sex, is what the studies told us. You know, so I, I should be happy about that. I'm having sex three times a week, right? I was miserable with that. And so by the time that we had been married for 25 years, after our 25th anniversary then, I, I, had, I decided that I just was not gonna continue. I was 49 years old. I was gonna knocking out the door being 50 and I wasn't going to be 60 years old and still miserable like I was, and uh, sexually speaking. I mean, I was very happy in many ways in my relationship, happy in my business world, but sexually, I was miserable. And that had an, a, 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 an overbearing effect on the rest of my life, that s miserable sexual energy. I mean, it changed my personality where I did not necessarily have the same likable personality as what I'd had much younger in my life. And so I went to my wife and I suggested that she have sex with someone else. And I didn't say that was a man or a woman, was she or whatever she wanted to do. And I'd have sex with someone else. Well, the first mistake that I've learned, I realize now, is you see is that I should have gone to my wife just talking about what I was interested in doing because she was a very submissive woman, and she was a submissive woman submitting to me for her whole life out of her weakness, not out of a place of strength. She was not a strong woman. Her family raised her to just be a, a very weak woman. She was a, a rather mindless. She didn't mentally process much upstairs. And, um, and, so, and so, you know, my mistake was is that suggesting that she would have sex with someone else because then she saw that as a huge threat because they are, you know, I mean, I was, she was, she was submissive to me. And, and so she was, again, reinforced in church, submit to your husbands. And so she was thinking like this, then is something she'd have to do if I, if she was going to stay married to me. Uh, so instead I should have gone to her and just said, you know, I think that maybe one of the things that I know, my gosh, you know, our church is going to be totally you know, and I don't go to that church anymore, but the church you're going to, they're going to be totally against this about me having sex with someone else. But I think that maybe if we had an open relationship where I could go and have sex with another woman, that maybe that would be a solution to our problem. That would have been a much better way of approaching the situation. I, but I did not do that. I said, you know, you have sex with someone, and I have sex with someone. Ooh, boy. That was the first time in our whole life that either one of us had ever even mentioned or thought about divorce. And she said it right away. She says, I'm divorcing you. Well, the next day, she went off, talked to the pastor at church. And sure enough, the pastor suggested, yes, if he's thinking that way, you should divorce him. She went and talked to her best friend. Her best friend said, yes, you should divorce Mark. She came back to me and she says, yep, we are getting a divorce. I am leaving you. And, uh, and I looked at her and I said, well, but for what? Because I love you enough to talk to you? Because I'm willing to communicate with you something that's like the, at the deepest places in, of my, my thoughts and my inner being? 
they, I mean, I, I wasn't talking to anybody else. I wasn't thinking about anybody else. I didn't have anybody else in mind. I had not been with anybody else. All I was doing was talking to my wife about having sex with someone else. And so after about two weeks, she said, she agreed. She says, okay, if you just, if you just don't talk about this anymore, agree not to talk about any of this for a year, then I will not divorce you. And so I agreed not to talk about it for a year. You know, I mean, I knew her at that point. I mean, we'd been married 25 years. And so I knew her well enough to know that also she just really needed that time just to process things in her mind and not to get to where she's just automatically feeling threatened. So sure enough, a year went by and to the day, and she was expecting it, to the day I said, hey, it's been a year. Can we sit down and talk about this now? And she says, we can talk about it all you want, but we're going to get a divorce if you ever decide to want to do that. And I said, well, but we can't, can't we just talk about it? And she says, sure, we can talk about it. So we started to talk about it. And from there, I put together a, a, a plan. Uh, and I says, well, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? And she says, well, none of that would hurt anything. It's not like you'd be going and having sex with anybody. And so we can do those things if you want to. One of the things, the first step was that we would sit down. And at that time, there were very few books on this subject. And there's been a lot more published since then. This was 11 years ago. I mean, it's 2018 right now. So this would have been about 2007. And so 2007, there weren't very many books. But there was The Ethical Slut in the first edition. And we, we sat down and we read that together, page by page. Not to read it together, but we read it out loud to each other. We spent one to two hours a night, two or three nights a week. But we did it to communicate and talk about what we were reading. There was another book that had just come out, and it was called Open by Jenny Block. And so we did the same thing with that book. And those really were the only two books that we could find on the subject matter. And, uh, and so we read both of those books, and we read them, and we talked about them. And the whole idea was that we would then have better communication and talking our way through these books. That turned out to be a great thing, something I recommend to all couples now that are going through this process. And so then, after we read our way through those two books, the next thing is that, well, you know, I, I belong to this Yahoo group. It's actually it's a Christian swingers group. You know, can you believe there's Christians out there that are swingers? And it was a Yahoo group, and, and, and that some of those people are in the Seattle area. And, in fact, it's the group started in the Seattle area. And so how about if I go on to that group and I just post and just see if there's anybody that would be willing to meet with us. And so I did that. And sure enough, we have people that are willing to meet with us. And we started then meeting with other people. And she's like, you know, because in the church, we're, we're told in the church that anybody, that, that this is just such a, a terrible thing to do, to have sex with somebody outside of your monogamous marriage, you know, and particularly if you do that, as a, if you're married and you're doing that, it's, it's like you're, you're some kind of pervert and you're just, you're just an awful person. And so in my mind, we had all kinds of contrived thoughts about what people would be like and what they would look like. You know, that people would actually, that, that would be people who would go out and like be swingers and things like that. We learned that they weren't like that at all. That they were really nice, decent, wonderful, loving and caring people. Friendly, even. You know, and so, and, and when we went out and these people would invite us to, into their homes, they weren't hitting on us. You know, they weren't trying to have sex with us by having us in their home. You know, because they knew where we were at, you know, because, I mean, if the, if we were open to that, I suppose they probably would have hit on us, you know. I mean, my wife was a good-looking woman, and that's a good-looking guy, and so I suppose that they would have hit on us. But they didn't. They just opened up their hearts to us, and we asked questions, and they gave us information. Well, through that process, then, we, my wife had met a woman who went from Washington, D.C., came here to Seattle to go to seminary, to attend seminary. And in, in the process of attending seminary, she's a single woman, she became a swinger and going to seminary. And, uh, and so as a, as a swinger, though, my wife really took a liking to this woman, and they became close friends. And so one day, she, this woman asked her, my, my wife, says, well, my wife's name was Lisa. Lisa, well, what can you, what do you have to lose by just allowing him to go out and have sex with other people. And she thought about that and says, 
yeah, if I'm willing to divorce him, what do I have to lose? So she came home that day. I remember that day very clearly. And she says, well, Mark, let's start talking about what this would look like and what we need to do to get there. And uh, she wasn't interested in dating anybody, uh, but allowing me to go out there and have sex. And her motivation at that point was then that if I was having sex with other women and enjoying myself, then she'd never have to have sex with me ever again. And uh, she kind of liked that idea. And so, so, she, uh, so we sat down and we said, well, we probably need to create a safe sex agreement. And, and some other people we talked about, uh, talked to about, had said they have the relate, this thing called a relationship agreement. So these two written agreements that were on paper, on a computer, and, uh, and that we reviewed at least once a year, if not twice a year, and we'd update them. And the relationship agreement particularly was just full of rules, things that I had to do so that my wife would not feel threatened. Today, I totally disagree with that concept of a relationship agreement, um, but that's for another another uh, video. But so anyway, so then I, I, we, we started forming these agreements. And in the process of doing that, we came across this website of an organization here in Seattle called the Center for Sex Positive Culture and CSPC. And they had this thing about, they're talking about on their website called polyamory. We had never heard of polyamory before. And uh, so we started looking into that because she said, my wife, she, she told me, she said she's the one that discovered this. And she says, well, that's really more like you, Mark, because it's much more relationship focused. You know, you have great sex with, with other women because you're in a relationship with instead of just having a random casual sex. And uh, she says, you know, I can't really see that you, somebody would be interested in random casual sex, but this thing polyamory, you would be. And so we looked into it and sure enough, you know, that that really was more suited for what I was looking for. Somebody that I could be emotionally involved at a light level with, you know, not deeply in love with, but have a connection with. And yet, and be someone that I'd see regularly, I'd date that person, and uh, we'd have great sex. And so that started my journey then, and I became polyamorous. My wife remained monogamous with me. I became polyamorous. I would typically have two or three girlfriends at a time. I mean, I'm going to Oregon all the time, and so I would, would uh, have a girl, always usually have a girlfriend in Oregon, and then I'd have one or two girlfriends here in Seattle, and then in addition to my wife. And so that's kind of how it all got started. And then uh, went along like that for about three years and was, was going along really well. And my wife says, I like how this is working out for us, Mark. And it's working out so well that, you know, if I met a guy that I felt was as great of a guy as you, I mean, this is her words, not mine, as great of a guy as you, I'd probably be interested in dating him too. But like most of we go to all these events within the poly community in Seattle, well, a lot of events, you know, we went to a monthly poly discussion group and a potluck group and lots of events going on. And she says, but you know, I just, I don't like any of the guys that I see going to these, these events and stuff. And so she says, if I could find a guy um, as good as you, then I'd probably date him. Well, and so uh, she kept her, her options open, at least at that point. And I started a local poly hiking group where I just put it out there online where um, anybody who wanted to join us could. And there was someone from my hometown, lived literally not even two miles from us, that he joined the group. Now, he had been divorced for 10 years, hadn't had sex in nine years. But he was a really nice guy. I liked him. And so after a couple months, because we'd go hiking once a week, that once a, at, least, at least two to three times a month, we'd go out on a hike that I had organized. And, um, and so I liked this guy, and I saw, said to him one time, because I had, at that point, I had three girlfriends and a wife, and I said, well, Jim, let me tell you how this works, because I realize that you're, this is all new to you. You're very kinky, been involved heavily in the kink community years ago, but not into this whole thing about relationships with people. If you are interested in dating anybody that I'm related with, you know, my girlfriends or my wife, if you're interested in dating them, you don't have to come and ask me. All you have to do is go ask them. If it's something they want, then they can date you, and, and you know, that's, that's up to them. That's between you and them, because I don't have any ownership or in control of, of my girlfriends or my wife in that way. And so they're free agents, and so it's just whatever the, the two of you decide. Well, within a month, he was dating my wife. Within two months, he was dating my wife and one of my girlfriends. Within a month, in two months, actually, two, three, you know, three months down the road now, he's dating my wife and two of my girlfriends. And uh, and then my other girlfriend, he tried dating her, but no, she wouldn't have anything to do with him. And uh, But he'd say, well, Mark's got good taste. What can I say? So Jimmy, well, boy, he was having a good time. And uh, then after about um, eight months of dating my wife, he convinced my wife that she had no reason to keep staying, living with me. 
and uh, that she'd be much better off living with him. And so that's when she decided that she was going to divorce me. And that, for me, opened up the doors to a whole new world. You know, at the time, I just thought it was a terrible tragedy. <laughs> and after three months of depression <laughs> and finally deciding I was going to get on with my life, it opened up a whole new world for me. And that's when then, uh, it, was, it was two months after that, so five months after my wife said that she was going to divorce me, and she's still living in the house. She just down in a different bedroom in the house at the opposite end from where I was. And, uh, and coming and going, she'd come home and go down to her room and just totally ignore me unless she had to come talk to me about something for about the divorce and all that. And Jimmy would come in and go down to her room and they'd do their thing and then he'd leave. And, and so, you know, it was like, I wanted to be happy and she seemed to be happy. And so that was, that was fine, even though that, uh, yeah, meant that our marriage was over. And so at that point then I decided it was time to get on with my life. And uh, my girlfriend, uh, you know, one of the, the, the gals that I was in a relationship with, well, by that time, over time, um, things had gotten to where I was just in a relationship with my wife and had one girlfriend at that point when my wife said that she was going to divorce me. So my girlfriend, she, she was getting ready to go ahead and move into my house with me when my wife was going to move out, then my girlfriend was going to move in. And, uh, and so, you know, things were going to be fine. And, and so then um, I decided then after about three months, it was time to get out and start to socialize because it was doing me no good staying in my dark den of a, of a home office and just being miserable and depressed day after day after day. And so I decided to go ahead and get out and socialize. So my girlfriend and I would go out and, and go to these poly functions here in the Seattle area and I'd put on the happy face and I'd go out there, hey, everything's good, everything's good. Inside I was just, oh, I was hurting. I was really hurting. But I didn't want to tell anybody that my marriage is over. You know, after 33 years of marriage, and it's over. Didn't want to tell anybody that. And it took me about a year to, to, to well, not quite a year. It probably took me six months before I even started opening up about that. But in that process, though, um, here was about uh, September, October, November, December, January, February. It was, it was about five months, um, January 16th, that I end up uh, meeting Kathy, and who is today. Uh, this, you know, the woman that I now live both in Seattle and with Chris, and I live in Ventura, California with Kathy, and, and she's just a, a, an incredible love for me. And, and, and Kathy and I, we, we've grown tremendously. We've been in our relationship now for over four years, and we've grown tremendously, and we've really helped to move ourselves from a place, because she, uh, she had just been divorced for a year at the time that, that she and I got together. And she had a boyfriend at that point, and a girlfriend, and, uh, and then I was just her other boyfriend. And, uh, and so we have progressed where this idea, instead of being sex positive, we'd be sexually liberated. And it's had a huge impact in our relationship. Now, people don't always understand the difference between being sex positive and sex, sexually liberated. And so I encourage you to go ahead and, and uh, watch my video on that. Just do a search here on my channel for sexual liberation, not the Yahoo bar, but the search where you can search for videos in, on my channel and put in sexually, uh, sexual liberation. And do that search. And in fact, I'll go ahead and put a link in the description here today. And, uh, and so, but Kathy and I learned how to become sexually liberated. And it's been so freeing and so wonderful. And in fact, uh, last night I went out to a party and had a very lovely time. Uh, Chris is, it's a party where Chris, I'm in Seattle, so it's a party that Chris in the past has been to me and gone with me to these parties. And uh, they put on once a month by a group here in Seattle. And Chris usually goes with me, but then last night she was sick and she didn't go. And I had a lovely time. I met a lady, so I'll just say hi to T, because uh, she wrote me an email. I had, uh, she would asked me, well, you know, do you go to California for your work? And uh, I spent a lovely evening last night with her. And, uh, and then uh, she sent me an email today and we've been chatting a little bit. And then she says, well, do you go to California for your work? And so I gave her a link to my YouTube channel here. And she came back from that. Let me go ahead and read to you her, her email to me. She says, what you do is amazing. You mentioned you got into this lifestyle 11 years ago. What got you there? I would love to know more and learn more. And, uh, and so this video is, is in response to her question. So thank you, T. And I appreciate that question. And I'll send you the link to this, uh, this video so that you can enjoy watching that. 
And, but so anyway, that's kind of my journey then, where then when I got involved with Kathy, um, at that point, you know, I mean, uh, I felt like my relationship with Chris, my relationship with Kathy, and I was, felt like I was kind of polysaturated at that point, but I wasn't done wanting to have sex with other women. And so that's where Kathy and I started to move on and be move in the direction of just enjoying ourselves without any restrictions on each other, just enjoying ourselves to live a fully sexually liberated life with each other. And it's been a wonderful and a beautiful thing uh, to, to really feel that ability to just to be able to go out and be sexually liberated and enjoy that sexual, wonderful experience with other people. And so that's been my journey. I hope you enjoyed hearing about it here in this video. I ask you to go ahead and click on that link down there in the description box. That link will send you over to my, um, my page where you can opt in and get on my email list. And I encourage you to, to get on my email list so that when we have things for, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm, I'm the, the co-founder of Non-Monogamous Lifestyles Association. And then we've got some great things that we've got coming up. And so if you want to find out about those, you get on our email list and you'll find out more about the association and the things that we have coming up for non-monogamous people. But then also give this video a like. That'll tell me that you appreciated my taking the time to make this. And also besides giving it a like, Go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. But please also go ahead and ask your questions, just like T asked me this question in an email. But in the comment section below, ask whatever questions you have of me. I love to answer questions. I'll probably make a video of it instead of asking, answering it directly to you, unless it's something I can just give you a very quick answer about or something. But um, maybe your question will be the, the reason for another video that gets made on my site, and I appreciate that. But go ahead and make a comment or ask a question there in the comments section. So thanks a lot and have a great week.